Welcome to the Proceedings Podcast. I'm Bill Hamlet, the Editor-in-Chief of Proceedings at the U.S. Naval Institute. Today is Friday, January 19th, 2024. It is snowing in Annapolis, and it's good to have you on board, everybody. Today's show is brought to you by the members of the Naval Institute. Since 1873, 150 plus years now, our members have provided the foundation for everything we do, from proceedings and naval history to press books to events and conferences, Members receive Proceedings Magazine print and digital or digital only, and big discounts on Naval Institute press books and invitations to member-only events. To become a member of the Institute, go to usni.org forward slash join. Now to get to my guest, retired Navy Admiral Scott Swift was the commander of the U.S. Pacific Fleet from 2015 to 2018, and he's the author of an article in the January Proceedings titled Wartime Command and Control. He's joining us today from San Diego, where it is not it is not snowing. Admiral Swift, great to have you on the show. Hey, Bill, thanks for, uh, thanks for the invitation and, and thanks for the, uh, the opportunity to uh, have an article published in, uh, in Proceedings. I, I'd like to open up a, a little bit off subject of the podcast and, and talk about uh, your intro and uh, encourage listeners to uh, seriously consider uh, joining um, USNI, the, the foundation on which proceeding stands, um, either on, in a monthly basis or uh, as I have done as a, as a lifetime uh, member. The reason that I did it is because of all the things that USNI and proceedings did for me throughout my career. Um, um, if you look at the, the mission of, of USNI, you can't help but see yourself in it. Whether you're a naval officer uh, across all the naval services, including the Coast Guard, or if you're someone that is uh, either concerns or studies uh, uh, naval uh, power and uh, naval capability. Um, so that's one one reason that, that, that I joined. It's also been a great voice for me. I found it as a vehicle, certainly later in my career. I wrote several articles uh, that were published when I was the PAC fleet uh, commander. And as it, I, it was... Uh, I was finishing up that tour. I had done some things in the classified realm, specifically to the fleet, and I felt it was very hard to get them out into the, the public domain, if you will, the public domain being proceedings. And so proceedings is a wonderful place to publish. There's no place else I could have published this article that we're here to talk about other than proceedings. It, it is a launch point for ideas and discourse and dialogue. Uh, so I'd encourage you uh, seriously to consider supporting it. I hate writing um, uh, with a passion. Bill has been after me to write this article for at least three or four years now. And it finally got to the point that uh, I felt that it, it was a requirement um, to, to write this article based on all the other things that I'm doing now that I'm supposedly retired. And one of the reasons was the scenario that, that Bill wrote that uh, this article, in fact, this last phase of uh, American uh, seat power uh, continuum is founded on, uh, you, I would ask that as you read the article uh, and as you listen to this podcast, that you have that scenario right next to you uh, so that you can refer to it. It is compelling. I mean, the first thing, time I read it, I thought, holy cow, this is classified. Um, but it's all unclassified sources. It's just fantastic. And it's just reflective of the work that US and I and proceedings do together. Uh, another encouragement to please uh, consider joining. So with that, Bill, I'll turn it back over to you and, and we can continue. Uh, I, I appreciate it, sir. And, and the scenario for, for our listeners and viewers is called The War of 2026. It's in the December issue of Proceedings. You can find it on our website. If you just go to usni.org uh, and click on the American Sea Power Project, it is one of the top articles in the uh, American Sea Power Project. But you can also go back it's now almost three years old. The Sea Power Project has been going on. Uh, and you can read from the Strategic Ends articles that we had at the beginning to the means of sea power and now into phase three, the, um, the, the uh, uh, sorry, the, um, the, the means of sea power now with this, that is structured very much around this uh, War of 2026 scenario that everyone has been talking about uh, and, and yet some have been avoiding talking about it. It's the Davidson window. It's the China Taiwan scenario. It is a, uh, a very not not meant to be predictive, but it is meant to be a very stressful scenario to give experts, as we did in this case, Admiral Swift, uh, to write about a particular aspect of how we might have to 
uh, fight that war. In the submarine area, it was uh, Bill Toady. In um, in the surface domain, it was uh, Scott Tate and Anthony Lavopa. He was on the on the podcast a few weeks ago, and for command and control, Admiral Swift's uh, article. So let's let's get to that article now. Um, so uh, you and, and I wanted to say, sir, um, the reason that we asked you to write about this is because of the articles you wrote for us in 2018 when you were the, uh, the Pacific Fleet commander, but also because of the command tours you had. Uh, you commanded a carrier strike group in the Pacific. Then you commanded Seventh Fleet in Japan, and then you commanded the U.S. Pacific Fleet. So you have, uh, you know, personal knowledge and uh, and experience with command and control at the very high level in the Pacific, focused on this China-Taiwan problem set. And so you were the right person, uh, as many of us agreed, to write this article. The article is titled, Master the Art of Command and Control. And uh, as we've you know, discussed, you're very passionate on this topic. So, so let's just talk about, um, uh, you know, what were your initial thoughts on that War of 2026 scenario when you read it, the first time you read it, and then how that uh, impacted your thinking on command and control for it? Yeah, th thanks for that, Bill. Um, again, what, what pushed me over the edge of, of uh, agreeing to, to write uh, once again uh, for uh, proceedings and using proceedings as a launch port, uh, point was that scenario and, and the fact it's the same comment that I made earlier about uh, I felt that there were some really important things to get into the unclassified domain to get into the public domain to get into the domain of debate that that proceedings fosters that's why I wrote those previous articles and that's why um, I wrote uh, this article um, I, the, the idea that the Davidson year that people talk about, and I, I don't think Phil would disagree with this, is um, I, I my first response is to push back on that concept that, you know, oh, oh my goodness, you know, this, these terrible things are going to happen in, in 2027. Uh, to be clear, they could happen tomorrow. This is going to be a decision that the Chinese Communist Party is going to make on their own based on their own assessments of, of what their risk is, risk to party, um, risk to the mission um, that they're on and risk of not doing anything that comes up often in the com conversations that uh, that I have it's reflected in a lot of the debate about Red Sea and where are we on, on the cost curve there but uh, not, not the purpose of, of this discussion so I, I uh, it's compelling uh, command and control is uh, deterrence um, you know we we have to be ready we don't know when that call is going to come and if we're trying to develop a command and control structure in run as crisis is developing around us um, I've, I've never seen it success uh, it, it be successful it, it's almost uh, always um, a lesser than if we had uh, built on it and so those those four elements um, that are within command and control are important um, you may want to talk about those but I think the two biggest pieces that I would say in direct answer to your question, uh, I have come to the conclusion, um, willing to debate it, that we have to separate command from control in how we think about the problem set. And oftentimes when I'm speaking to foreign groups, I'll say control and command to, to generate a thought barrier between the two. So could, and this is a, a core point of the article, overly simplified based on time. But command is the purview of warfighting commanders. That is the, the mission function task side, to, to put it in a Pacific scenario. That's what Admiral Aquilino and Admiral, well, Admiral Aquilino are, are charged with. He is charged with that uh, getting after the mission functions and tasks necessary and assigned to counter a, a peer threat in, in the Pacific. The control side is where the service chiefs are. That those are the structures that support the theories and, and the relationships that represent command relationships, whatever that command structure may be. It, it may be a JFC command, it may be a JTF command, it may be a service command. There's multiple uh, variations on command that, that can be adopted, um, but it's going to be either supported and enabled or not supported and limited by the control side. I hesitated. I was going to say Admiral Paparo as well, but Admiral Paparo wears two hats. He he wears the 
the mission function task hat, as well as the man train and equip hat. So that, that's where the components are a little bit different as they have two masters. One is the warfighting master and Admiral Aquilino. And the other is the man train and equip master, which is on uh, the service uh, side of it. And the last, last thing I'll say, I just think this is really important uh, to put into context is the work that, that Admiral Small is doing is for the CNO on the man train and equip side, but trying to get after that velocity, uh, that speed that that uh, Admiral uh, Aquilino continues to hammer on is that we can't continue to rely on the traditional acquisition system to deliver these enablers to what he needs in command and control. That is what Project Overmatches is, is all about. So Admiral Small is trying to turn very rapidly on the on the uh, uh, man train and equip side of the equation to turn capability that can deliver the on enable the command and control uh, mission functions task structures that Admiral Aquilino is pursuing. Long answer to a, a short question is a challenge I think that we're going to have going forward is, is to curb that enthusiasm that I that I have. If you get command and control wrong and everything else perfect, you'll, you'll be still be sub-optimized. Everything starts and ends with command and control. Yeah, good point, sir. Um, so in the in the heart of the article, uh, you discuss four big ideas. Uh, first one is mission command and commander's intent. The second one is command relationships. The third one is supported, supporting. And the fourth is a joint command structure. So let's break each of those down quickly if we can. Start with mission command, because in my mind, reading your article and working with you and the edits, uh, this is one of the most important uh, points that you bring out in the article. Well, it, I'm a little concerned if that's the case because it's not a new point. I, I, I have to refer to the footnotes. I I, I was you mentioned. That I I tell people that I'm not the expert on any but anything, but I have a lot of experience. You know, I, as you say, I've had a lot of command experience from 04 command, and I don't think I went longer than a tour without following with a command tour, and many followed one on top of the other. That's just a victim of 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 uh, opportunity, you know, I, there's a, I'm just very fortunate in that way. So I, I, I bring a practitioner's view to this command and control uh, piece. Being Admiral Willard's J3 at Indo-PACOM was a, a, a master's, I, I felt like an intern. It, it, it was a doctoral course in command and control. He, he was, and he is brilliant. I would encourage you to read some of his articles that he's published in proceedings coming back to that theme. But everything starts and ends with mission command because there is no guarantee that the man train and equip side, that the systems that support whatever your C2 structure are gonna allow the communication necessarily for commanders to understand what's happening at the tactical edge and deliver capability and guidance to the tactical edge. That's why mission command is so important. It's very, very difficult. You have to practice it every day. So what you have to constantly be thinking, how am I gonna make sure that my forces are focused on key elements that not only can be uh, foretold looking ahead, but emerge as, as the fight develops uh, how can I ensure that they that that unity of effort, that unity of mission will continue if I am separated from my ability to both sense, to get information from those warfighters about what's happening and give them guidance as to what they should do now? Do priorities change? That's why that mission command piece is, is uh, so important. And it's not the it, it is it is the responsibility of the commander, but it's not not the unique role of the commander. Mission command as I say in the article, it should change as events change. It shouldn't be event based. It should be a, uh, it shouldn't be time based. It should be events based, and it's a dialogue. It's the result of a dialogue that's going on with the commander, his peer commanders, and it's on down to his subordinate commanders and his senior commanders as well. So that everyone up and down the chain of command understands what the commander's intent is what they're supposed to do. And if they if they lose the ability to communicate up and down the chain, they they have a uh, they have a very good sense of what to do and they also feel empowered to do it. That's, ex that's exactly right. I talk about the delegation of authority on the empowerment part. And, and I would also say that the one point I would add and restress is that mission command comes from the commander understanding all those elements up and down the chain of command as well. It has to be fully informed on reality. 
Okay. All right. So let's move on to uh, the your point about or points about command relationships in the article. So this is a little this is a little simpler. I didn't bring this up in the article in the interest of time, but there there are uh, when I think of of command and control, I think of the science of command and control is the structure. It's the org chart that people are are familiar with. Um, what are the boxes? How do the boxes relate to themselves? You know, some of them are supported supporting relationships. Some of them are opcon take on relationships. Those are the lines that that connect them. What is critically important in everything that we do, everything, it took me a long time to realize this, especially in command positions. What's critically important is the, the most critical element is relationships. It's true in your professional life. It's true in your personal life. So you go back to Guadalcanal as the example. Nimitz had been pushing a ton of, uh, so one of the other things I'm, I'm on this proceedings track uh, track now is, is the history that's reflected in proceedings as well. So another good reason to join and read. So in, in uh, Guadalcanal in World War II, Nimitz had been pushing a ton of resources down into that fight and did not understand why things weren't uh, progressing at the rate that they should. And I think my view is based on the history as I read it is that he came to the conclusion after a long period of time, three or four months, because this is the art side of assessing your commanders, that the problem was Gormley. Gormley was not pushing as hard as he should push. So he had the decision, Could he, would, do he, does he send Halsey down there or does he send Spruance? Spruance, in my mind, the ethereal thinker, the, 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 the uh, deeply considering um, what the options are, very, very thoughtful leader. And Halsey, the brash, shoot from the hip uh, uh, kind of leader that he was. I mean, look at what happened in Lady Golf with Halsey being um, pulled off to the uh, deception group in the north. And look at Spruance being pushed uh, uh, because Halsey was physically unable to move into Midway, what Spruance did in Midway and his criticism of not pushing, not, not chasing the Japanese uh, fleet more aggressively at the end. This is all about relationships. Who did he pick for Guadalcanal? It was Halsey because he needed somebody to go down there and, you know, kick butt and, and get it done. He felt yeah. that the resources were there. So that is what is key about mission commands. It's to get the box structure right. That's getting the command and control right. But who you put in those boxes, what personalities you put in those boxes, that's commander's decision space. And commanders need to change who is in those boxes based on um, the manifestation of what occurs as individuals operate in those boxes. Very, very personality based. We see that in our command structure now. CNO is making decisions about who to promote as admirals, not just on uh, experience and uh, expertise, but uh, also uh, proficiency, that personality side of it. Who is the right person from a personality to put in that command position? That's why so many people scratch their head and say, why in the heck did she make that decision? This individual would have been perfect. She has a much broader perspective, uh, perspective of what perfection looks like. That comes back to this idea of command relationships within a, a command structure. Okay, let's move on to supported and supporting. Yeah, so this is easy. This came up, I've uh, been traveling week before this week and week before last. And, and uh, again, kudos to the work that you've done on, uh, and I think proceedings was the right place to place the article. It's generated a lot of debate. I, I, I wasn't at NSA, but I've got feedback from people that were there that the article was was discussed both by keynote speakers and, and certainly on the margins, uh, margins as well. And one of them was this idea of supportive supporting. And the key takeaway is pretty simple, that if, if you've got a supported supporting relationship, it's because you don't have enough resources to support the tasks that you've been given. No one that, that owns command structure fr from a mission function task, uh, a tactical uh, take on opcon perspective, uh, picks supported supporting as an ideal option. We only do it when we don't have enough command structure to get after the missions, uh, functions, and tasks that we've had. So we should be very careful, very thoughtful about why we're seeking to pursue uh, a supported, supporting relationship instead of a, uh, a, 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 a tactical uh, a structured relationship. The other thing I'll say on that note, if you, if you are either assigned as a supported commander or tasked as a supporting commander, 
you need to you need to say i need an implementing directive before i can do this an implementing directive is a doctrinal document that defines what the relationships are because if you are a a supported commander you need to understand uh what all those that the the the, the uh, corollary to that is what are all those supporting commanders to you what other commanders are they supporting because that gets down to the challenge of we don't have enough resources to get after the fight it's it, it is a it is a relationship of necessity because we don't have enough resources to get after the fight and supported commanders will find that they don't have those critical assets if they don't understand through the implementing directions what other tasks are assigned and those supporting commanders need to understand often they have multiple commanders that they are supporting how how do they make the trades with the resources they have i just did a podcast on, on logistics uh, contested logistics. All logistics is contested. It starts with the C2 relationship. And almost all the time, logistical commanders are supporting to multiple supported commanders. This this is a the first step down Red's ability to interdict blue C2. We do it to ourselves. Be very careful about supported supporting relationships. Uh, I want to tease out a little bit more on that because uh, one of the things that you bring up in the article which is, I, I think it's a, a very, it's, a, it's understated, but it's a salient point, is that for this war 2026 scenario, for a China-Taiwan, you know, broad scale Indo-Pacific war, uh, all of the combatant commanders and all of the unified commanders are gonna be involved in some way because Indo-PACOM touches NORTHCOM, it touches SOUTHCOM, it touches AFRICOM, it touches European Command, it touches space, it touches transportation command. It, you know, it, everything is involved, right? So I'm, I'm, do you even think it's, is it possible to avoid supported supporting there? Or, or is it just, it, it's such a, a broad over encompassing sort of problem set that you're, 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 you're bound to get into that, that uh, kind of a relationship? I, well, uh, I would say you're bound to get into supported supporting relationships because I think that's why the, the, that point resonated at SNA. We don't have enough resources to get after the problem sets that, that we have. You know, we talk about op tempo. Yeah. And and we're, we're constantly operating be beyond uh, what the system design can support. You know, we're constantly doing more on the mission function, function task side then we have the support for the man train and equip side and it, it ultimately goes up to congress and the president that signs the budget we're headed into another cr i mean we can go off on a whole nother podcast if right. you'd like to on that but yes right. we're going to end up in support and supporting but let me get back to to your other point it's not i'm less concerned about adjacent cocoms okay i'm more concerned about uh integrated cocoms prc is a nuclear threat Stratcom will have real concerns. It can't be supported supporting. Stratcom has a mission set yeah. that cannot be ignored. We always say Homeland Defense is, is the, the first mission set of every COCOM commander. So Stratcom has huge skin in that game. So Stratcom ha has to have a firm say to Indopaycom and the other COCOM commanders. You cannot take that action. I'm gonna take that to the president. I'm gonna take it to the tank. Take yeah. it to SecDef to make sure that that's cleared. Stratcom is the same way. I don't want to get into classified, but it, but if if uh, uh, transportation com, if there are certain actions that if Stratcom activates certain capability, transportation's command ability to support anything else becomes extremely limited. I won't yeah. go into what exactly I'm talking about, but this yeah. audience knows specifically what what the the current concerns are there. So that's the logistics piece. So we will have supported supporting relationships, I think, across terrestrial, uh, 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 global, geographic uh, COCOM barriers. But those broader COCOMs, NORTHCOM is the same thing. NORTHCOM has has uh, huge equities with, from a global perspective. Because that homeland defense thing, STRATCOM is part of defending against it and supporting it. NORTHCOM has just as critical role to play to understand if certain actions are taken in certain theaters, it may be beyond the ability of NORTHCOM to manage from a, from a homeland defense perspective. And so NORTHCOM has to have 
the opportunity to speak up, that cannot be a supported supporting relationship. That has to have a direct command relationship. Gotcha. That's very helpful. Uh, makes sense. Uh, now, so talk- I, I will say this, Bill. We had a long discussion about the closing of the article and, and the, the point on Einstein. This is my point, is it should be made as simple as possible and no simpler. We run the risk of trying to make command and control simple. I think I said this earlier. It is extremely complicated. You need to embrace how complicated it is and, and try to have a clear understanding of the risk that you take by making it too simple. Copy. Yeah. Uh, talk a bit about jo- joint command structure in this. Case. Yeah. Yeah. So I got, I have strong views and I'm stuck in the past. You know, I retired, it's hard to believe over five years ago. Um, so I'm a big believer that um, understand what uh, uh, the uh, JFC is, the joint force commander is. That is really the centralization of, of command of the, the broad joint force. And then CTF commands are lesser than. I've always thought about two kinds of CTF commands. One is a functional CTF command that, for instance, logistics that may spread across supporting multiple JTF commands, not in a supported supporting relationship, but in a direct command relationship. The CTFs are are, uh, uh, command, you know, standard commands as you think of them. They have mission functions, tasks, and assign. And, and a, a vehicle of convenience is to give them geographical space to contain the effects that they need to create. This is a point I'll make now, not directly, well, indirectly related to this. That doesn't mean that their forces have to operate within that, that, that JOA. Their, oper- their forces could be in a coordinated way operating outside that JOA, but the effects that those forces create Whatever, if they terminate inside the JOA, if those effects are created, kinetic and non-kinetic effects within the JOA, then the CTF commander has to specifically command and control those things. So, in, for instance, I use a, a reference to relationship that uh, uh, UCOM and Indopaycom has with respect to uh, Eastern Russia, especially in the maritime domain. There needs to be a clear understanding that if if UCOM wants to create effects in the maritime domain in the near, in the Northern Pacific to manage their whatever challenges they're having in Europe, that that has to those those fires need to be cleared and supported by Indopaycom because Indopaycom owns that that domain, if you will. So I, I think there there needs to be a better clarity of of how you get after that uh, that joint command structure and how you command it. But that the last point I'll make on the joint command structure. It is uniquely American. It is uniquely American. Now, my my, I just was in a conference earlier this week with representatives from across the Pacific, and the UK was there. Uh, Germany was represented. Australians were represented. So, so to to all my my uh, partners, peers, and friends out there from from other countries, um, I'm not diminishing the joint command structure that the Australians have, that the British have, that the Germans have, that others have as well. But those joint command structures are singularly focused on national command priorities. They're commanded by civilians, German civilians or British civilians or Australian yeah. civilians. So we need to understand the bifurcation that com- uh, that, that uh, changes. So when you talk about joint command structure, you're talking about alignment with national civilians to get after what those national uh, uh, concerns are. That's why part and parcel to this, I would encourage your listeners to read the section on combined command. It needs to be a different word. It's not necessarily a different construct. Um, It's the same construct, but you have to recognize when forces are joined from across national boundaries, um, you're going to run into challenges that don't exist within the joint command structure and need to be addressed as you build out that that C2. That's that's the biggest point about joint command structure, that we can bring other deputies in from other countries, but they are aligned to whoever that joint structure is aligned under. If it's, if it's foreign deputies and, and leaders within a U.S. joint command structure, you have to be very careful about national caveats that get into that. The ROE may be different about what they can execute, and especially if they're commanding national forces within a U.S. joint command structure. But that's another two-hour discussion. I'll I'll, I'll stop there unless there's something else that you want to tease out of it, Bill. I wanted to just tease out a couple things um, to to help maybe some of our listeners and readers um, put concrete thoughts around uh, the the 
commander of the joint force, uh, joint force commander in this scenario, in the war of 2026 scenario, um, is that is that likely to be the Indo-PACOM commander? Is that Admiral Acalino? Uh, yeah. or, is it, or is it uh like who who would be in this scenario the the CJTF commander? Yeah. Um so uh, let, let me let me start off with a caveat here. I did not write the article for Admiral Aquilino. Admiral Aquilino. No, 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 no I know you help. didn't. I, got, I, I just, know you didn't. I'm just, let, I'm just trying to. Out of the table. Yeah. So I'm going to answer the question, but I want to make okay. sure those that are listening don't misconstrue. People take things what you write and and redefine it based on what their own interests are. Sure. This was not an article for Admiral Aquilino or Admiral Paparo no, or, no. or General Wilsbach's going to be moving moving on and for for his relief or. Uh, uh, General Journey, any of those folks that are uh, commanding uh, General Flynn. I just saw General Flynn earlier uh, earlier this week. He has uh, an article. Oh, by the way. Oh, General General yeah. Flynn, by the way, has an article coming in the February issue. Yeah, so I had a great conversation with him, and a lot of it was centered on the article. So back to what proceedings done. It's a thought piece. It's not perfect. My, my yeah. ideas aren't perfect, and they're yeah. somewhat dated. Although I'm still heavily engaged with those that are still in command positions out there. So absent that. The, the point that I made that that uh, Admiral Aquilino and I did have a, a quick conversation about the article um, and and he was appreciative of it mentioned it in his in his uh, public comments um, it's just another piece that's added to his thinking he doesn't need that 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 help from me so this is just my view based on the scenario that that you have have written and provided it could be very different in the real world but I do believe that the cent the, the centralization of uh mission is critically important and if there's a conflict that occurs within the indo-pacific domain that geographical boundary of the indo-pacific um that that the command needs to be the, that that command element separately and control out that command needs to be centralized in the indo-pacom commander just as it is in europe if, if, a, if with Ukraine, that command is centralized within the commander of Yukon, that there's sure. no different. Yeah. And, and my personal view is the place to start as you design that centralization of power is a joint force commander. It separates that, it elevates that commander above a JTF command. Now, there may be multiple JTF commanders to take this beyond just the centralization of, of that command and control at the joint force commander. There can be JTF commanders, as I mentioned before, multiple, some that are functional. There may be a JTF commander for logistics, for instance, a peer with the other JTF commanders. We need to stop talking talking and thinking about logisticians as a lesser than warfighter. Mm. They are critical to our warfighting. I talked earlier, a little, just a, another real quick divergence on history. When you talk about the key warfighters in the Pacific, and you, know, you might say Nimitz, but often the names that come to mind are, are Halsey and Spruance. You know, they did the, le the the port and starboard thing before it was uh, left and right um, in, in the vernacular of OAF and OEF. So I asked the question: Who was the if, who was their logistics uh, commander peer? Who was the big the big guy that was running logistics? Who was it that that built CBs up into something that was real? Who was it that built that southern arc of logistics going into Australia? Who was it? It was Nimitz. Nimitz felt logistics was so critical that it could not be delegated to others. That's why the Battle of Coral Sea was so important. It wasn't just about logistics. It was about keeping Australia in the fight. So that there, there should be, and I don't want to get into things that Admiral Aquilino and, and his, his team of warfighters at the component level are doing out there, but I would not be surprised if there's a CTF for logistics that is a peer with the other CTFs that could be mission-focused CTFs, mission-focused CTFs, or they could be... Um, uh, uh, geographic boundary focused GTF uh, 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 CTFs. The CTFs are given battle space. We've got a combined force commander in Korea. That battle space is on the peninsula, but it also includes the maritime adjacent to the to the peninsula because that maritime domain is very important for that uh, commander combined force Korea to command. Back to the command piece because that's not a joint command. Gotcha. All right, sir. Thank you. Um, your article also talks about uh, a couple of other important factors. You touched on this a minute ago, but multinational operations and interagency coordination. Yeah. Uh, just, uh, let's, let's touch on that for a little bit. So start, as you're designing your command structure, and I'm purposely not 
saying control structure. It's very useful to look at other areas where there's been consistent success. And my experience of commanding large for formations in the Pacific as a JTF commander, Talisman Saber comes to mind. Go look at Australia. Uh, Australia, they've done a masterful job of bringing the interagency, of, of bringing the IC into their national command structure, the PGHQ that, that they've got um, outside of uh, Canberra. I share that as an example because oftentimes we say, oh, it's too hard. It's too fractured in execution. You know, we, we've got this wonderful uh, 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 structure that, that we're all uh, committed to protecting liberal democracy. And yet, as uh, Churchill said, you know, when <laughs> liberal democracies, paraphrasing him, um, you know, it's the last thing that people turn to when, you know, when all else, when all else fails. So it's messy in execution, you know, when, yeah. when, you, when you look at it. Those are some of the challenges that, that we're having now. Um, I think the Australians have developed a model that has been very effective and has proven, it's seer, it proven itself year on, year on in, in major exercises. It comes back to the structure of uh, the command piece of it. It comes back down to relationships, but having structure there so people can understand when the critical points are to communicate and what is the critical information that needs to be uh, uh, communicated. Uh, this is one of the benefits I don't think we do a, enough of that we bring uh, uh, foreign militaries in, into our command formations, but oftentimes we miss the opportunity not to bring their foreign service or um, their uh, intelligence uh, uh, formations as well into those those same those same structures. Gotcha. And and there's a, a point in your article where you mention the idea. Of, you 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 point out that oftentimes when uh, we do coalition warfare, that it, it this the C two is sort of a pickup game. You you yeah. uh, you you throw it together when you when you get the players, and then you figure out how you're going to command and control them. And, um, uh, you know, for this particular scenario, uh, you wrote something to the effect that we, we kind of know who the major players are going to be. And so you should build that command structure now and you should exercise it and perfect it rather than yeah. thinking you have to reinvent it every time right. you do something. Right. Yeah. Just to underscore that point, Bill, it's really important. You know, my experience is two years as the deputy commander at, at NAVSEN. Uh, coalitions are really important. Coalition hasn't come up. We, we should we should avoid uh, coalition structures. That is that we, we refer to that in, in a public sense as um, the coalition of the willing. It can't be the coalition of the willing. It has to be the coalition of the committed. And the coalition of the committed is a combined structure. Tell, tell me, as as the the leader, that this is back to Admiral Aquilino and and the, the critical leadership role that he does fill in the uh, in the Pacific. He has a mandate from the U.S. government to go do things. And so the, the question in a consequential peer competition needs to be, what is it that you're bringing to my command structure and to my combined forces that makes me better? Because a lot of times, if it's a coalition of the willing, we need them in for, for their national commitment or their support. That's not what this is going to be like. You know, this is going to be you know, potentially war on a scale of World War II. You have to bring real capability that helps fill gaps, deepens the magazines, deepens the resources of that combined force. Everybody has a role to play. You know, even the Philippines with, with a, a Navy as small as they are. I was just talking with General Flynn, 70% of their force is Army. And, and, and we've got this, I believe, this, this great strategy that, uh, started with uh, General Berger and continues now with General Smith with, with uh, the Marines on this inside force. It's reflected in, in their um, their uh, future force structure and the articles that they've written. But back to the articles to go read the articles that General Berger wrote and published in in proceedings. Um, why would you not want a team with as consequential an army as the Philippines have in space that you're going to need to maneuver in? This is an example of meaningful relationships with a combined force. Coalition is, is not, uh, uh, it doesn't go, go to the, the appropriate level. And it's really about the value that you can bring to the ultimate contest that, that is, uh, is either joined or soon to be joined. Yeah, I would, I would say including right, the willingness 
to uh, pull the trigger when asked to pull the trigger, uh, and the you know to, to charge into the fight, to uh, to move into contested space, to be in a place where uh, you know Chinese weapons are going to or, or adversary weapons are going to target you. You know, uh, absolutely. Yeah, as an aside, Edka just popped in my mind. It's also what it isn't. It's back to uh, relationships. It'd be very difficult to put U.S. forces in any kind of permanent basis. It's even difficult to do it in a rotational basis at these Edka sites in the Philippines. There's only one that's been used so far, and it was for an HADR mission in, in direct support of the Filipinos. So it's back to relationships, and it's understanding when would you pull the trigger in your terms to actually – put forces into that space. You may not, it may be just Philippine forces in a combined command and control effort. There may be a command element that's directing what their ac activities are. And I don't mean the U.S. is directing them. It would be the Filipinos direct directing them in concert with U.S. staff that may be embedded. Over to Admiral Aquilino, he's got that. I'm, I'm just spitballing at this point, throwing some examples of what the audience might consider. Yeah, we, we don't have time for it, but there is a section in your article. I just pointed out to the readers and listeners that you go through and describe what uh, co uh, coalition combined uh, levels of, of cooperation are. So is it cooperation, then coordination, and then collaboration, that these are different levels of being able to work with and rely on your international uh, allies and partners. And, Right, right. If I could pull the string on that, the last one is combined. So those four C's, if you look at the words, we don't have doctrine that describes what those relationships are. That's what, that's why I put that section in the article. It is not joint. It's that that won't work. And it's not a coalition. It's combined. But how do you get to combine as you transition from a competition that we're in now into crisis? and then eventually in a conflict. Eventually you have to get to combined. You may want to do combined in an HADR piece, but I'm not sure that those words are right. I'm confident that the concepts are right and we need some work. Join in the debate, jump into the dialogue through proceedings and offer your opinions out there. And that will inform because there's people in, in the Pentagon and, and elsewhere um, that listen to up on the hill. There's multiple audiences that your voice will get to if you communicate that voice through proceedings. And, and you know, some of those things with uh, with allies and partners involve, you know, are you are you buying uh, equipment that that talks to each other? Are you buying the same weapon systems or similar propulsion systems? Do your officers and and men go through and, and sailors go through the same kinds of training? Uh, do you have liaison officers uh, in, within each other's staffs? At what level do they share information? Do they have the same level of classification? All of those things, um, you know, co combine into whether you're collaborating or you're, you know, really combining right. your efforts, right? Right. Yeah. That's an important point, Bill. I know we're getting short on time, but I just want to stress that that uh, uh, Captain Sensi was was uh, uh, long retired now, but he was the 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 chief of staff at uh, at uh, NAVSENT when I was there. I, I just learned so much from him as a, as a brand new one star. And he had these quips that he would say, he'd point to the staff when they were complaining about how much work there was to be done. He'd look at them and say, hard is authorized. On this point, hard is authorized, but we also need to be smart. And it's not so much, it, and if hard is authorized, if you find yourself challenged with that prospect, make it easier on yourself. Instead of looking at the things that we need to go do Take a look at the things that we should stop doing. We have a ton of disablers that prevent that continuity of command on, on that man, train, and equip side. At least let's stop doing those things as a first step. You know, let's bring other people into that, that man, train, and equip side, side uh, so that we can rapidly come together on the mission function task side. Okay, uh, let's move on and talk a little bit about rules of engagement, because uh, yeah. one of the things that our yeah. editorial board and our staff members particularly liked in your article was that <laughs> was was that discussion, because it's often it's often sort of ignored. Uh, yeah. It often comes, you know, even when you're on active duty, it comes towards the end of the brief, not the front of the brief. Yeah. So, so yeah. Uh, let's talk about that for a bit. Yeah. Oh, okay. So maybe maybe you'll get a bounce out of this comment. I haven't. I've said this privately multiple times. I'm going to say it publicly, and I'll say it now. Um, I find myself with a sense of urgency even beyond what I had in uniform. These are challenging times that that we live in, and action is required. We can't continue to admire the problem. Back to what proceedings does. It's well beyond just admiring the problem. 
So here's the polarizing statement. I think we need AI driven ROE. So people in the, on the policy side immediately say, holy cow, we can't let machines control ROE. So let me back into having made that polarizing statement. Let me explain what I, what I mean by that. Um, and I, I've had this, prop, this, this conversation discussing this problem privately many times. This is the first time I've done it in a, in a public forum. My premise is that we'll have less blue on blue and more blue on red if we bring AI into that process of informing ROE. That's the premise. Um, the reason I, I say that is ROE, the core to ROE, and this is rightfully so why people get concerned with a comment like I just made, is ROE is the mechanism with which civilians control the execution of war. We can't lose sight of that. That's critically important. That's core to who we are as a liberal democracy, and it's core to drawing others to us in a combined structure uh, agreement um, to step on a path of non-kinetic and kinetic warfare. So I don't want to diminish um, the importance of civilian control of military operations through ROE. We're seeing this in Ukraine. We're managing the, re the, the assets that we we allow the Ukrainians to have as our way of maintaining a vestige of control of the ROE that we think should be there. That, that's, that's, what's, that's how we need to think about ROE. It's happening in, in Gaza. What the Secretary of State is trying to do is to influence the, the decisions that the Israeli government is making with respect to ROE in Gaza. We see it in the Red Sea. We're gonna see it in, in the South China Sea if we get to conflict there. It all centers around ROE. We, it has to be the first thing that we think of and, and the last thing that we think of, you know, throughout the whole five phases of, of, of war. So ROE is, is extremely important, but ROE is a disabler of military operations by design. It prevents the military from doing things that civilian leadership does not want the military to do. And it's handed out as an enabler piecemeal. So the strikes in, that, that have been conducted uh, by the combined force, joint force on the U.S. side, but the combined, combined force using intel from other uh, uh, governments, uh, those strikes are approved by the president himself. That's how important, and, and uh, that discussion, I'm sure, started and ended with, tell me what the ROE is going to be. Okay, now that we've finished this conversation, we've made this decision, just reinforce to me what the ROE is. Because that's where the president has control. Once he says, yes, I approve, the only control he has after that is ROE. So ROE is, is extremely important. But ROE is based on the conditions of peace. They're based on the conditions of phase one warfare, maybe phase two warfare. Um, as you transition from phase to phase, ROE needs to change. People say it becomes more liberal. It doesn't become more liberal. It's still centered on civilian control, but it has to be based on realism of what the fight is. Because if, if red is going to increase its capability, I guarantee you our peer competitors out there are baking AI into their ROE decision matrix. That's an argument why we need to consider it. So I'll, I mean, I could go on for another two hours on this subject, but to say we are not going to allow ROE ever full stop to inform uh, AI, uh, to inform ROE, we're putting ourselves at a huge disadvantage. We're, we're, we're already saying we don't understand what the technology is, but we're not going to let it be an ROE. I, I make this point to, to stress, to underscore your opening comment. ROE cannot be the last thing that we think of. It needs to be the first thing that we think of and continue to, to, to discuss it. It can't be just the realm of lawyers, operational um, uh, JAGs. It has to be baked in throughout the force. So you understand the liberties that you have at the tactical level of actions that you may need to take for your own survival. We call it self-defense ROE to the unit, but what about self-defense or the units to the left and right of you to another national unit? This is something that is back to, you can't, you can't, you, you put yourself at big risk if you try to make it too simple. ROE should be baked in from a commander's intent perspective from that commander, from Admiral Aquilino, what his thoughts are on ROE informed by SecDef and the president all the way down to that, that corporal, you know, that E1, that E2, that E3, that's fighting the war fight at the tactical edge. I, I, we'd love to have an article from you on, on AI and ROE, but uh, I, I think uh, uh, what 
what popped into my mind as you were talking about that, sir, it just reminded me of your comments a couple places in the article about the velocity of a yeah. Yeah. about command and control being able to allow you to to move with speed and and outmaneuver out out speed yeah. the, the adversary and if the adversary is using you know decision machine decision speed for things like ROE or other decisions and you're not then you know perhaps you are putting yourself at a disadvantage yeah certainly a a, a great point for a further on this you know follow on discussion yeah. and writing um, yeah so we're, we're, we're running out of time here. So uh, I, I just want to give you a minute to, to wrap up uh, any save rounds, concluding thoughts or any questions I should have asked you that you know, didn't have a chance to ask you. Yeah, it's, I mean, it, time continues to be my greatest challenge. And I took a red eye back last night so I could be here to do this because this is this is uh, this is important. Well, um, so, so I want to I want to acknowledge that up front. Um, so that I, I, I don't think there's anything, there's lots that we've left on the table, but there's just not time to, to address them. And you'll find them published, debated, uh, uh, discussed throughout, you know, the whole uh, magazine, the whole library of uh, proceedings. I, I will I will take the opportunity to luxury to touch on your point of, of uh, speed, because I think that's important. I'm really good at running fast in circles because I'm just, I'm so practiced in it. But that's not, we can't afford that. And we talk about, where do we want to be three years from now or five years from now? As if it's a point, a specific point of uh, uh, a destination. That's not the world that we live in. The best that we can do is have have like a, a, a diagram. And we want to be someplace on this horizon. We're highly confident based on what we know about today. What, what that provides you is a navigation path. It may change because of weather. It may change because of all different kinds of conditions. That's a path to start on. Start the journey. We wait until we, we think we know with perfection and precision where we want to be three years from now. It's going to change. Leadership changes. The conditions change. So start the journey. Don't wait. We can't afford to wait anymore. So that's where the sense of urgency comes. Velocity comes when we have a vector, when we have a commander that says to the staff, I want 10% of the staff focusing on this area of uncertainty, this area that we're not, we're 90% sure we know what that space is. And let's focus on this area where we think we should be conducting that journey in. That gives you a vector. Speed with a vector gives you velocity. We need to stop talking about speed and we need to start using the term velocity to communicate to our civilian leadership up on the Hill, in the White House, in, um, across the cabinet, in DOD. We need a vector. That vector is a vision. That's why commander's intent is so important. Commander's intent is a vision down to the tactical edge about uh, what that journey should that journey of discovery should look like. That gives velocity to the fighting force. All right, sir. That's a great way to end it. My guest today has been Admiral Scott Swift, U.S. Navy retired, former commander of the U.S. Pacific Fleet, and the author of an article in the January issue of Proceedings titled Wartime Command and Control. Errol, thanks again for your time and for your superb contribution to the American Sea Power Project. Thanks for enabling all that, Bill. Great editor. Appreciate it. Please write Thank for proceedings. Sure. Bill will make it good. <laughs> well, today's episode was brought to you by the members of the Naval Institute who support the open forum for those who dare to read, think, speak, and write about sea power. To become a member, go to usni.org forward slash join. A reminder, next month, 13, 14, 15 February, We'll be at West 2024 at the San Diego Convention Center. The CNO, Admiral Lisa Franchetti, the Secretary of the Navy, Carlos Del Toro, current Pacific Fleet Commander, Admiral Sam Paparo, are all confirmed speakers. Hope to see you there. If you're active duty, it is free to enter. And until next week, remember, victory begins at the Naval Institute.